we have um, Arthur Cole and Nigel Williams here to talk about their book. So welcome, gentlemen, and thank you. Thanks very much. I wouldn't clap yet uh, if I were you. Uh, what, what we normally do when we go on our world tour of South Wales uh, is that we tend to talk for something like 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then we throw the uh, throw it open to the floor. If you've got anything to ask, we're more than happy to talk about anything. I can even talk about coronavirus if you want. Um, but our journey as writers, I think we can call ourselves writers now after uh, nine books, scribblers, scribblers yeah, w w whatever, um, goes back probably I, th I think foundations of it go back to about 10 years ago. Am I breaking up? Can you, can you hear me all right? Yep. All right. Um, just about 10 years ago, I think I'll move this out a little bit because uh, I think it's just hissing. About 10 years ago, I was rapidly approaching my 50th birthday and uh, I'd always wanted to write a book. And I've, I've always written. I used to write for police magazines and things many, many years ago. And I thought, well, if I don't do it by the time I get to 50, then I'll probably never do it at all. So I sat down, I spent six months, uh, and I managed to write my first novel and uh, get it published just, half, well, just after my 50th birthday. And that was a, a book called Eden Relics. That's a glorious nonsense romp, uh, which is based in uh, the Swansea Valley. Uh, if anybody knows of Adelina Patti, uh, the the opera singer. It's uh, it's a sort of Clive Castle type adventure involving Adelina Patti, where I, I suppose I've taken a bit of a liberty and suggested she might have been a spy. Um, but I managed to do that, and the book actually went uh, went really well. It sold well. I got some interest from uh, one of the major publishers, but that came to nothing in 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 the end. And uh, I managed to. Um, write a couple of other books as well in the meantime. Uh, one of them was a sort of semi-biographical uh, police story for a, a gentleman called Alan Lloyd, who had uh, an MBE for his services to life-saving. Alan sent me a couple of chapters and said, look, can you have a look at this, see what you think? Because he knew I'd, I'd written a couple of books. And uh, I said, yeah, I'd sure, I'll have a look at them. I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'm no expert, but I'll, I'll certainly point you in the right direction. And then after he'd written the third chapter, he told me he'd an, a, an advance for the book and uh, that he needed to get it done. Unfortunately, Al died. It was extremely sad because he was a really larger-than-life character, a lovely, lovely man. Uh, so I asked the family uh, what they wanted to do with it, and uh, they said, well, they'd like to get it published. So they managed to find lots of other anecdotes and I put it together into a sort of fictionalized account of Ad Alan's life. That was called No Step Back. And that spawned two sequels, which was uh, a hot and a cold place. And it's based basically in Swansea in the early 1960s. So it's a bit like Life on Mars, if you saw that series, with Philip Glenister. Yeah, so, so Philip Glenister in Life of Mars was a real softie compared to uh, Alan Lloyd. Um, but then what I did was I, I made a, a post on, on a Facebook account, uh, which was a closed account for police officers, and said if anybody wants to um, write a book, then I'd be more than happy to continue doing this. And I only had one response, and that was from Arthur, and I'll let you explain what happens to that. But... There is something else I just want to point out, that you'll see that my name is uh, written as Nigel C. Williams. Well, I was actually born in 1960 in the Swansea Valley. And when I was born in 1960, my parents weren't very well off, so they couldn't afford to give me a middle name, uh, which is a bit of a pain if you ever wanted to have a personalized registration number on your car. Uh, but I had just that one name, Nigel Williams. And of course, after I started publishing these books, I realized it might be an issue because there's another author uh, from Manchester, a place called Cheadle Hume in Manchester, 
called Nigel Williams, and he wrote The Wimbledon Poisoner and a few other good books. And I knew it was going to be a problem when I got an invite to go to Coventry Library to do a talk. This was probably about two years ago. And I drove up to Coventry, and the head librarian came to meet me, and she said, oh, Mr. Williams, it's lovely to see you. Really good. Uh, if you come on in, uh, we've got your books already laid out. So uh, I thought, this doesn't sound right. So I walked into this uh, auntie room, uh, just in front of where I was supposed to be doing the talk, and lo and behold, there were the books, all by the other Nigel Williams. Now, being an ex-policeman, I thought, right, I've got, to, I've got to cough, I've got to own up to this, or should I? So what I thought I'd do is try and bluff it out. I thought, right, we'll just go and see what happens. You know, maybe just a handful of people will turn up, or if there's a load of people there, I'll just have to confess. So I um, walked into the room, sat down, all the books were there, and I thought, oh, what do I do now? And nobody turned up. <laughs> so I was a little bit disappointed. Uh, I went out to the car, I rang Arthur, Arthur was at home, it was a Saturday, Saturday morning. Saturday afternoon it was, Saturday and afternoon. Uh, I was watching the racing on telly, I was, so obviously when he disturbed me, uh, <laughs> I, burst, I burst into laughter, obviously, um, because it is quite funny that you go all the way to Coventry, and uh, I, I would have been sent to Coventry, but you were, yeah, really, yeah, you were really sent to Coventry. I was that really day. sent to Coventry, and, and then in the car on the way home, I rang my wife and I said, uh, Caroline, you're not going to believe this. Um, I've gone all the way up there. They thought I was a different author and nobody turned up. And then I started laughing because I realized they hadn't turned up for the other Nigel Williams, not for me. <laughs> so I, th I thought I'm going to have to put some sort of initial in the middle of my name just to distinguish me from, from the other one. So the only thing I could think of was C, and it's the Caroline. So uh, it's Nigel Caroline Williams. Yeah, so, so I let... You can tell me where he walks. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to tell you how we actually started uh, writing together. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a bit of background uh, about myself. Um, I was born in 1950 in Cairo, uh, which is, as you probably know, is a small mining village at the top of the Finvi Valley. Uh, my father was a collier, as were most of my uh, close relatives, my grandfathers. My grandmother was, uh, worked in the pit. Um, I'm one of six children, five boys and a girl. Um, all still living, thankfully. Um, I passed my 11 plus and I went to the Maestay Grammar School as it was then. Um, only two of us passed, so most of my friends uh, in junior school went to Flindero, which was like the comp. So I wasn't very happy about that, obviously, because uh, uh, I missed my friends. But uh, it, it turned comprehensive about a, about a 12 months later, so you know, we all ended up back in the same place. Um, I left uh, school at the age of just gone 16, and then in 1967, I joined the Glamorgan Police. Um, I was a cadet for two years, uh, then uh, I did my training in Bridgend, and I started my life on the beat in 1969 in Bridgend. Um, in 1973, um, I became a detective constable in Bridgend. And for the next 16 years, I worked the whole of um, the Bridgend Division, Porth Call, My Stake, um, and South Wales, basically. If there was a murder, you'd be drafted in for that. Um, I got promoted then in 1986 to a detective sergeant, and then um, I continued my career in Porth Call and My Stake. Uh, I, was on, I ran the special branch department down at the Cardiff Wales Airport. And then for the last four years of my service, I was a, a divisional detective sergeant on the special branch for South Wales. I was also the acting detective inspector uh, when the DI was, was taken ill. So for out of my 30, just over 30 years service, I retired in 1997. So out of my 30 years service, practically 26, 27 years of that, was, uh, I was um, on the CID. Um, I've dealt with all major crime. Um, and from murder right through uh, terrorism, I was involved. I've been involved in terrorism in inquiries and investigations. So, I've got the whole gambit of um, serious crime. Um, when I retired uh, in 1997, 
Um, I took up a job at uh, a nursing home in Puff Call uh, as a gardener and handyman. And in between then, I did a, just after that, I did a couple of other odd jobs as well. Um, uh, I retired in when I was 65, and for 14 years prior to that, I was uh, the handyman gardener at the Glanarava Nursing Home in Tondi uh, for dementia. Uh, I did all the gardens there, drove the bus, uh, did the painting and decorating, so did all that. So I retired in um, um, when I was 65, 2015, and I started playing golf. Uh, at the end, when I was in school, um, I enjoyed uh, all the practical sort of um, subjects, metalwork, woodwork, technical drawing, but I also enjoyed English literature. And um, at the time, the English literature teacher wasn't sort of very good when I look back at it, but there's no disrespect to her, but, uh, you know, she just gave us a book and we used to read it. Then one day, uh, the headmaster came in and into the class, and he said, uh, this afternoon you're going to have a a new English lit teacher, Mr. John. And he said, I want you all to behave and treat him, treat him tidy. So I was up the back with my mate, Tony Orker, reading the football weekly, as he used to then. And um, this fellow walks in, and, and he's handsome. He's about 23, 24 years of age. Nice, long, auburn hair, handsome man, um, wearing um, denim jeans, a check shirt, cowboy boots, and uh, a cowboy jacket with tassels on. The only thing he didn't have was a Stetson and a horse. <laughs> so he's walking in with a dance set record player. And I say to Tony York, oh, who's this? Who do we know? Anyway, he goes down the front. He puts the dance set record player on, uh, on the table, plugs it in. He puts his foot up on the chair. And he starts talking like an American. And I said to Tony York, I said, I said he's, a, he's from America, this book is. And then he goes, I am Mr. David John, your new English literature. I was born and bred in Nantamoyle. <laughs> so, being a valley boy, I said to Tony Walker, I he was born in Nantamoyle, but I'm, a, I'm the Pope. Anyway, he put the record player on, and he played a song called The Universal Soldier. Uh, it's a song written by Buffy St. Marie. Everybody sang it. Uh, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, you name it, they've all sung it. It's an anti-Vietnam song. Um, and all he does, he introduces himself and he plays the song. And after the song, he just says, like, like we will do later on, what do you think about it? What's it about? And you start chucking the questions at him. It's about war, so it's uh, Vietnam. And, and he develops them for the lesson. And he hooked everybody. Uh, he hooked the girls before because he's so handsome. So, you know, the, he's, he's halfway there. But he yucked everybody, and, and he totally changed the way English Lit was taught in the My State Comprehensive School. What he'd done, Rebecca John on the news, you know Rebecca John with the, the pretty girl with the, with the blonde, the, the white hair? Rebecca is David's daughter. Now, David ended up, uh, I think he was deputy in the Education Authority. Uh, David, he passed away now, sadly. So he sort of inspired... Uh, English literature. He changed it completely. And, um, but unfortunately, shortly after I left school and joined the police, obviously. Um, at the end, in, in 2015, I'm on a lot of coal mining sites, because my father, as I say, was a collier, all my family, and I'm on a lot of coal mining sites, and World War I sites, because my, my great-grandfather was in the war. Um, and I read a poem that had been put on a site, and I thought, I wouldn't mind writing a poem. Not that I'd ever written poetry. Um, so I wrote this poem, Marba Van, and uh, everybody liked it on the site. So I started writing poetry, World War I poetry, um, coal mining poetry, any poetry at all. I couldn't stop. Once I started writing, I couldn't stop. Pri bearing in mind, prior to this, I hadn't written anything. The only things I'd ever written prior to this were files of evidence for murderers and kidnappers and rapists and all that type of stuff. Which is basically like writing a book. Uh, you've got all the statements, you put them all together, and it's basically a book. So um, then Nigel put this post on the, on the site. I got in touch with him, not by phone or anything, just on the internet. And uh, yeah, Can I just point out that this site that we were on, it wasn't one of these dating sites like no, Tinder or anything like grinder. that? No, Grindr. It wasn't nothing like that. No, no. Anyway, so I got in touch with him. I said, look, I, I, I like to write a book. He said, we've got new plots. I said, we've got millions of plots, haven't I? 
you know, which I have, I've got thousands in my head. And um, he said, well, create a character, uh, which I did, which is Terry Maguire. He's a detective inspector. And he said, create some other characters around him. So I create a forensic pathologist. I speak the scenes of crime. And I got, got the, and I send him a thousand words down. I got the plot. I don't hear nothing from him. And then I have a message off him. I like that. I've got another plot. So he said, yeah, I've got loads of plots. So I said, send him another plot down. And he said, well, corrupt police officers. And then Nigel, I didn't hear nothing from him again for a few days. And then um, he says, I like that as well. He said, just keep writing. So I wrote about... 35, 40,000 words of my own, and then Nigel did a filler plot in the middle about a flasher on the dunes in Treble Bay. Um, that's the best plot. That's the best plot. <laughs> and um, after about, it took me 10 days to write that book, and after about uh, three weeks, Nigel got in touch with me and said, look, I've got your book. I'll meet you in Puth Car. And I met him in the, uh, in the cafe. We had a cup of coffee. I never met him before. Didn't know him from Adam. I knew he was an ex-police officer, but I, I didn't know anything about him. Yeah, but I was traffic, so you, yeah. they don't trust Yeah, well, I'll come on to that, Nigel. I'll come on to that now. <laughs> I'll come on to that. Right? So hang on now. Hang fire. Anyway, uh, so he gives me the book, and he signs it, and we have a chat about it. This time. I was never going to write another book. It was a bucket list book. I'd written it. Nigel had put it together for me. And uh, that was it, basically. I ain't going to write another book. So... We're having a chat, I'm having a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and uh, he says then, we'd publish this. And I go to him, Oof, hang on a minute now. <laughs> I ain't publishing nothing. And another thing, don't ask me for any money, because we ain't having it. Typical CID. I've heard about you publishers and stuff, but I, nothing, I didn't know anything about publishing and writing. He said, no, no, I got an account with Amazon, he said, and um, we'll self-publish it. And he said, we'll have royalties. So I'm thinking, I'm ching, 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 thousands of pounds, you know, millionaire in a fortnight. Anyway, it doesn't work out like that because every book you write, you have 30 pence. Amazon has seven pounds and you have 30p. So that, that's, that's the way because you self-publish. Now, Nigel is self-published for years. So we're, uh, we're there now and Nigel says, can we write together? And I say, well, what do you want to write with me for? You write your own books. He said, no, we'll, I think there's something in this. You know, we'll, we'll crack on with this. So we wrote the second one in about a month. It's a bit longer, and as, as we've written them, they've got longer and better, right? People read them, so they, they got better. So that's basically how it started. Now, what, what we did then with, with the royalties, um, we found a charity, which was Marie Curie, and for the first five books, um, we gave the royalties to Marie Curie, which was a thousand pounds. Bear in mind, you're only having 30 pence a book, so you can work it out how many books you sold. So then after, after we gave him the thousand pound, we'd written another three books and uh, we gave those to the Ganwin Trust in my stake. Um, a dear friend of mine's son got killed in a plane crash in, in Asia with his fiance and um, they've got a trust up in my stake for him. They're going to build a big thing up in the woods. So we, out of the royalties for that, then we gave them a thousand pound as well. Really. So out, out of the eight books, um, we made ourselves £2,000 in a short space of time. So what happened then, um, a friend of mine, John Wake, after we'd written the second book, John's a, an historian from Cardiff, and he was being published by Octava Publishing in Cardiff. And he rang me up, he said, why don't you go to Octava, speak to David Norrington, who's the pub, one of the publishers there, and have some advice of him. Nigel couldn't go, so I went down with the first two books. Um, and I'll show you the covers later on, but uh, they're nothing like that. Those are new covers. And um, I have an hour with him. Nigel tells me what to ask, because I, I don't know what I'm doing, obviously. Um, and he says to me, what do you think of your covers of your books? I said, well, you know, it's a book, like, you know. He said, well, do you, uh, he said, uh, what do you think of them? I said, what do you think of them? He said, well, they're not very good, are they? I said, well, whatever. If you say they're not very good, they're not very good. He said, do you want to see my first book I wrote? I said, aye. So he pulls a draw out and shows it to me. And he says, what do you think of that book? I said, honestly? He said, yeah. I said, it's crap. He said, I know it is. He said, this is my new book. And, and you see the difference in the professionalism of it all, right? Uh, with the publisher. So anyway, I come back, speak to Nigel. And we, we keep writing, don't we? We keep writing, yeah. tuning the books out. And then I went to another presentation of John's. And who was there? It was David Norrington. 
and he, he shook my hand and uh, he said, how are the books going? I said, they're going great, David. And so he is now Word Catcher Publishing. So I, I was in the presentation, I came home and I said to Caroline, I said, I think I'll ring him about my poetry, my World War I poetry, my coal mining poetry. So I ring him and he says to me, um, I'm passionate about poetry, however, there's no money in it as a publisher. I said, that's fair enough. I said, there's no problem, I'm just asking you, like, you know, you know, no sweat. Like. But then he says, send me two of each down on a PDF, two of the World War and two of the, the mining. He said, I said, how many have you got? I said, I've got about 200. He said, send them now. So I sent them on a PDF, and the following morning, I had an email off him saying that he'd publish all my poetry. Um, so I went down, I signed the contract with him, 50-50, but he does everything, right? Does everything. So um, when I'm there, now he starts talking about the books, and he looks at the reviews on Amazon, and he says, uh, how many books have you written now? I said, we've just doing the ninth. Uh, Raven, which is a, a new one. Terry Maguire is in it, but it's a new character as well. And he says, um, I'll republish the eight, and I'll publish the ninth. I said, what do you mean? You? I said, do you want any synopsis or anything about these books? He said, no, I'll publish them on the reviews. So he said, I'll have to speak to Niger. So I came home, I rang Niger. I, he said, how did it go? I said, um, I've given him two and a half thousand. I said, he asked for two and a half thousand pounds to publish my poetry. And he goes, oh, God alive, what have you done? I've told him I'm giving money. I said, no, no. I said, he's, um, he's going to be my publisher. He goes, oh, you've done well, but Yeah, fair play. He said, you haven't been Don't speak like that. You haven't, you haven't been writing long. He said, uh, I'm, I'm so pleased for you, he said. He said, I've been trying to get published for 10 years. I said, well, you either got it or you haven't. You know what I mean? Because I wouldn't go to Coventry. If I went to Coventry, I'd have my own books up there. But um, so anyway, um, and I, I, I break the news to him. I said, Nige, I said he's going to publish all our books as well, a crime thriller. And apparently, and not for two and a half thousand. And not for, for nothing. <laughs> he fell off the chair. Apparently, Carlin said to me when you told him Arthur, it was like sort of you giving him the pools. Like, and to get a publisher is like winning the pools. It's it's very very difficult. Nigel sent hundreds of synopsis of his books. And just reject, 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 reject. They chuck them in the bin, they do, basically. Um, they read it. So, well, well, in my case, they probably examine them quite closely. Yeah, and then chuck them in and the bin. And then chuck them in the chuck bin, yeah, the that's bin. right. So that's basically the story of uh, how these books were created. So the, if you would said to me four years ago that um, you'd have three poetry books published and you'd have like nine crime thrillers published, I'd have probably said to you, you must be having a laugh. Because I would never have believed it. Um, and if any of you are writers, and mm. I, I think there's a gentleman there that's written some books, it's very, very difficult. I don't find it difficult. I don't make any notes about anything. Uh, the poetry, I'll get the subject, I'll get the first line, and I'll write the poem in about 20 minutes or half an hour. It's the same as the thrillers. I've got all the plots in my head, and I know where I am with the 11th book at the minute. We're halfway through the 10th, but I know where I'm going with the 11th. Um, and what we do where we do it is I write a chapter, I send it to Nigel. Nigel will have a look at it. If he wants to add stuff, he will, and he'll do the same. If he's got a chapter, he'll send it to me. I'll have a look. We've never had a crossword since we, we've been writing. Yes, we have. When was that? <laughs> it's time in, isn't it? Uh, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and that's how we write. And uh, we meet each other about... Four times a year, Yeah. Uh, obviously when we're doing the talks, but uh, to actually discuss anything, like I was down there a fortnight, three weeks ago with Raven to do the, the final edit, um, and what we did with that this time, which we haven't done before, um, people who follow us, we've sent them an email, the book, emailed the book to them before the final edit. Yeah, they called it advanced reader copies. Advanced yeah. reader copies, so, and, and then what we tell them is, read it, if there's anything in there, that's wrong, just make a note and then we'll amend it accordingly or take stuff out or put stuff in. Uh, and that's what we did this time with Raven. Yep. Um, they get longer, all these books, uh, Unethical Conduct is about 40,000. It's about 45,000. Yeah, and, and they get longer. Raven could have been 110,000, but the publisher says a thriller is going to be 75 to 80,000 words. Uh, anything over that is a novel. Um, 
So that's basically how, the, how, how all this came, came about. And um, that's about anything else? Uh, not, no, no, not really. I, th I think the um, the thing that I liked about um, about the books, uh, well, when Arthur sent me the the original files, was that I could see that there was potential in them, um, and he had so many plots. I mean, one of one of the hardest things for anyone writing is probably to have a decent plot. Uh, the the rest of it can come. Uh, you can always polish your writing. You can always learn to write better just by doing it. But it's the plot is the real problem, really. So with someone like Arthur, who's got loads and loads of plots from experience, it's easy for me then. Uh, we like to call our, ourselves like Ant and Deck, plot and polish. Arthur, Arthur will come up with the with the plots, and I'll I'll then add fillers and I'll add characterization, uh, scene scenes, uh, touch smell. Uh, sounds and uh, and the books build up in that way and what we also tried to do was to try and keep them as realistic as possible what police work isn't like um, midsummer murders you know where they'll they'll go every week and uh, people are dying by the dozen and it's, it's amazing but he lives there uh, but there are always plots continuing. So in other words, a, a detective will be dealing with a case, then a murder will come in, everybody gets involved in the murder, the plot is put on a back burner, the, the subplot is put on the back, uh, back burner, but it's always running somewhere in the background. So what we got in the books from the first one on, like the flasher in Treco Bay, um, Treco Bay is quite, uh, quite sort of personal to me. Uh, in the 60s, my grandparents had a caravan in Sandy Bay, uh, which is just behind us here. Obviously, you know that. Uh, and we used to come there every every summer without fail. We used to have a free week in Sandy Bay, and I used to love it down on the fair there. And uh, that plot, for example, doesn't get solved in the first book. In fact, I don't think it gets solved until quite later on in the series. But that's how things are. Uh, sometimes uh, crimes will take perhaps a year to, to get solved. And we wanted to keep it as real as possible, so that uh, we're not showing the detective as uh, so, sort of a superman. He's not infallible. He makes mistakes. Uh, but generally speaking, there has to be someone, a lead character in any police station, especially a detective, who you can go to and you can trust and you know that he will do the right thing. And unethical conduct is about police corruption. And... The amazing thing about it is that uh, some policemen have said, well, how can you betray your colleagues? You know, how can you say, uh, write something about corruption in the police, you police yourself? Well, actually, the whole point of it is to show that if somebody does step out of line, there are policemen there who will bring them back in and actually make sure that they face the consequences of their action. But you've had some great comments about that one, haven't you? Yeah, when, uh, when Unethical was published first, uh, my phone was red hot in the house. I had a policeman, ex policeman, ringing me um, about the book. I said, Have you read it? They said, Yes, we know who they are. I said, Well, who are they? They said, Well, you know who they are because you've written about them. I said, It's fiction. It's all made up. I said, The characters are probably real, it's fictionally real, but the plot is made up. I said, You could take that book there to anywhere in the country, Scotland, Ireland, put it on a desk in a CID office, some detective will pick it up, go to the toilet and have a read of the first chapter, and he'd be on there for about two hours. <laughs> and he'd probably say, when he came out, I know these are. Because they're everywhere, in every walk of society, right? In every organization, right? I, you know, people here, maybe teachers and other people. You know yourself, you're in, if there's 50 teachers or 50 nurses or 50 doctors, you give a few the swerve. And the police force is exactly the same. You're in a family, but you think, I don't want to go near him because I know what he's like. But he'll get caught, which is what happens there. You've got a DCI who's corrupt, still on the drug squad. And it's all based in Puth Call. All the plots in these books are based throughout South Wales. So anybody who reads them will identify with the places. You'll have Treco Bay, you'll have uh, the Pavilion, you'll have uh, Danner Cave, Rest Bay. 
So anybody who reads them um, will have an affinity with the places. And I think that people who have read them said that brings something to the books as well. Um, it, it's local to South Wales. People say, yeah, but it's just South Wales. Yeah, so what? You know, I don't want to be reading a book about Scotland, right? Or, you know, Zanzibar. I, I want, I'd rather read something local I can get my teeth into. And that's the way they are. Um, Terry Maguire starts off as a DI, right? He's the detective superintendent now. He's in charge of the major crime squad at the minute. But he, in the second book, he's a DCI on the drug squad because he's, he's obviously locked up. Um, Rosa was the DCI, so he's locked him up, so he takes his job as well, which is what happens in the police force. You know, it's, you know, get short of him and put him in there. It's changed a little bit today because you can't do it. Because in the 60s, 70s, 80s, he was the best man for the job. But it's different today in the police force. They go in with degrees. They want to be a sergeant after a fortnight. They want to be an inspector after two years. And then you're a chief inspector after five years and you haven't done nothing. You know, you've been on the beat perhaps, but you've, you haven't been on these. No, Nigel was on the traffic, right? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Nigel, if, if he turns around, you see his backside is very shiny. Because he's always in the car. Sitting in the car for eight hours. Fucking speeders with a gun. Well, I was a proper detective. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, 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 I, I, was, I was out there. I was on the cold face, as they say. Yeah. No, but jokes aside, it's you. You mean you meet these people and? Oh, you're of, joking? Are you? Yeah, you're joking. It's the first time he's admitted that. So, and I worked right through South Wales. I was a detective constable here from 1980 to 1986, working over here when I was a chief inspector, an inspector, five sergeants and about 30 PCs over here, right? That was in the 80s. They say crime have reduced. It hasn't. It's a load, of, load of nonsense. You can't get a policeman here now. Okay? So you, you work it out. In 1980, when this place was buzzing, you had all them people. It's still buzzing now in the summer, and you're going to believe, unless something serious happens. I, w I went then, um, I was up in my stake, I was a, DS, a DC in my stake for five years, I was a DS up there for four years, I was a DS here for three years. I've, I've seen the way it's declined um, for the locals. There's nobody they can go to. Um, you're on the phone, you ring up. It happened. My sister all around me the other night, my nephew is he's into, uh, he repairs um, trailers. Horse trailers, just any trailer, he, he repairs them, right? He rents a trailer, a, a £10,000 trailer, to a woman in Mountain Ash uh, in August. And she pays him up until December. And then she stops. He can't get hold of her. He finds his trailer in a field in Swansea, and he's got a tracker on it. So he knows where his trailer is at any one time. He goes down there, it's in the field. All the liveries been taken off it. Okay, so it's just a plain trailer. She's stolen and sold it, isn't she? He goes to the police station in Swansea. He says to him, look, this is what I've got. I've got a tracker on my trailer. It's in a field just up the road here. Uh, I'd like to report it as stolen. Nothing to do with us. It's a civil matter. No, let me tell you now. 10, 15, 20 years ago, a detective would have been in the car with him up to the field, itched it up and take it home. And they'd have had to call traffic to come down to, to, to and the traffic. Them. The traffic would have give, <laughs> escorted them. Yeah. The farmer who bought it, a £10,000 trailer, who he's probably bought for a grand, would be locked up, as would the woman from Mount Ash. Today, civil debt. Load of nonsense. And this is, this is what's happening within the police force. It's all political. You've got, um, what's his name? Michael, Alan Michael, you got Alan Michael, political, political posts, they're all political posts. And they tell the chief constable what to do if you disagree, if chief constable, you got the, you got the power to sack him. The, de the detective chief super from Gwent to uh, Brooke Johnson, who I worked with, he ends up as a police and crime commissioner in Gwent many years ago when he started first. First thing he does, sack the chief constable. First thing he did, he used to work with her. <laughs> he was the detective chief super. Now he's the priest and crime commissioner, and he's got more power than the chief constable. And that's the way it's gone. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, that's a sad, sad thing. Can I just ask you a question? Yes. Um, 
Oh, you know, you've uh, spoken to people earlier that were. Since they've had these, uh, these commissioners, yeah. the crime rate has gone up and the number of police have gone down. Exactly. The, uh, the last I read of that money was department was costing 2.7 oh. million pounds a year. It's phenomenal. The and staff he's got is second to none. It's, it's, it's cost under the two point seven million could go back into the police, yeah. couldn't it? They can have people on the beat. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 Unfortunately, like, you're speaking too much common sense there. Uh, you shouldn't do that. that uh, it, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a political position and to take the power from chief constables. Like, you failed them, Ian. Oh, yeah. You, yes, you, Can you, you cut that bit out? Cut that bit out. <laughs> I did a talk, yes, in the WA, and we were talking exactly you talking. In 1971, I was on the beat. I couldn't drive. Sony was just opening. It was the day Sony opened on the industrial estate. They had a big, it was a big thing there. Big, mm. oh. Walter Sage was the superintendent in Bridge End. Walter Sage. And I'm out on the beat. It's about half past nine. And I have a shout. Confer with the superintendent at the police station. I thought, what have I done? That's the first thing you'd think, isn't it? Couldn't ever see the super. He'd be in his office. The sergeant, the inspector would be running, running the job. It only went to him if there was something wrong. And he reached me outside, and he was a big man, right here, and he had a bit of a stoop. And he was a lovely fella, fabulous boss, and he said, Co, take me around the beat. And we, right, we walk in for about two, two and a half hours around the beat, and put him in the gen, went walking around. And then I stopped, we stopped, and I said, uh, I said, Super, why are you down Sony's um, with this big sort of thing down there? He stopped, he said, let me tell you now, Cole, in 40 years, you take all our money, and you'll be gone. I said, 1971. Came back, he signed my book. I came in for dinner then, either I was with the sergeant, another gentleman been in the Welsh Guards and stuff. And uh, I said, Sarge, I said, super, got his hair off. He said, he was a prisoner of war with the Japs. He absolutely detests them. Nobody would tell what the, nobody could tell Walter Sage, go down to Sony's. But you tell him, I'm not going there. Today is different. Father Michael said, go in the corner there. In the corner, they'd probably go. Because he makes the policy. And it's, yeah, that, mm. You know, they've opened this thing in Lantwit Major, you know, where they've got the fire service, the ambulance service, and the police together. It's always been the same. When I was on a beat in Bridge End, I was always in the fire service. I was only in the ambulance station. That's the way it was. They were reinventing the wheel. But they haven't got the men now that they had then. Like over here, you had like 30 PCs in 1980. I bet, I bet if you went in there and asked half the PCs who the licensees of the town are, they probably won't be able to tell him, but he never out. And it was the, the job of police officers and detectives to know all these people. Mm. It's like going into schools. I was going into schools, country comprehensive school in, in the 80s. Then they, they created this schools liaison officer then. So loads of resources went into schools. But you didn't want them in the schools. You wanted them out on the streets. That's what people want to see. They want to see Bobby's on the beat. Whether it'll come back, I don't think it will because it's gone too far. But what Arthur was saying about numbers, um, what, what I didn't tell you, uh, when I uh, wanted to join the police in 1981, David East was the chief constable in South Wales. And David East was big into rugby. If, if you remember back in the early 80s, South Wales police were probably the first professional rugby team in the world, I would think. Um, and I applied to join South Wales police and couldn't get in. Um, so I had no option. I, I joined the Mets. I did my training in Hendon and I spent three years in Brixton from 1981 to 1984. In Brixton at that time, every single shift, so there were four shifts, every shift had 50 PCs, thereabouts, you know, 48, 52, so averaging 50 PCs. We had three sergeants and two inspectors per shift. So what that meant was that you could go on the streets in Brixton, and this was at the time of the riots, you could go on the streets of, the, of Brixton, walk down Railton Road, and if you got in trouble, all you had to do was shout, and somebody would hear you. You wouldn't have to use your uh, mobile radio. You could just shout, and somebody was close enough to come and give you a hand. So imagine the shock to the system when I transferred back to South Wales in 1984, and uh, found myself posted in a panda car up on Blind and Mice or Penland or Town Hill, where you'd been sent to domestics, people going absolutely nuts, 
and you perhaps have to wait five minutes or ten minutes for assistance because the nearest uh, officer to you was perhaps five miles away. Um, so a big difference then as well. All re or even in those days, you could see the numbers starting to decline uh, back then. But I mean, it's nothing compared to what's happened in recent years. Uh, the, and in all fairness to the police officers serving now, they're doing the best they can. Um, and that's, that's all you can say, really. They're, they're really up against it. Well, I think, I think every... <coughs> They've eroded every profession, right? Teaching, it's a mess. The Welsh government have interfered with everything. Nursing, national health, police force, the fire service. The fire service shot themselves in the foot because years and years ago it was, we go into homes, tell people how to prevent fires, which is what they've done. So your fires have reduced. So they say, well, let's get rid of the fire service. Then. We don't need all these men anymore. So whereas you had you perhaps in the fire service here, like 20 people in 1980, mm. because they're in the homes, I'm telling people, look, you've got to have a smoke alarm, do this, do that. Your, your, your fires drop. So say, for example, you had 50 fires every year in Puthcall, and now you've got 20. Do you need, do you need 30 men? So they say, well, we cut them. And, so what they're, and then nothing's decreased, really. Crime hasn't decreased. Uh, you, you mean teaching? They want teachers now to do everything. You know, from the time they come through the gates... You're like, you're like parents now, basically. You know what I mean? Um, mm. Teachers are there to teach. Read, write, whatever. And that's what they're there for. They tell me now that we got some kids who are illiterate. And I, I can't believe it. You know what I mean? I think, myself, well, what's happened? All you do, you start them off in primary to read, to count, and then leave them progress. But I don't know where it's all going. But that's the dark side of it. Just get away from that now. Um, yeah, and uh, as you were saying about teaching, the, the other thing I, I neglected to mention was that uh, in 1995, 1994, I was hit by a stolen car uh, on duty on a night shift and fractured my spine. So my policing career came to an end then. So uh, I, it was either a case of um, living on incapacity benefit or doing something else, and I couldn't stand the thought of staying at home. Not, not that I didn't love my wife, etc. You know, it was nice to be with her, but I, I wanted to do something. So I went back and retrained. I went to university. And now I teach at uh, uh, Gower College in Swansea, uh, Gosainan campus. And you, there again, you see, in, in the time I've been there, I've been there 20 years now, 21, 21 years, I think. Oh, no, 20 years. And uh, you can see courses being cut. You can see members of staff being, uh, being basically... Uh, got rid of, and th th this, it's not meant to be political, this, but it, it, it is worth noting that if you don't have teachers, then you don't have a product. It's like going into Tesco's and taking everything off the shelves and just having the managers walk around. You know, that business is not going to last. And unfortunately, we, we're just not investing things in the right place at the moment. He's very modest, Nigel, as you, as, as you probably see. Um, he's pilot. He's got a pilot now. Yeah. yeah, he's a pilot. He makes guitars. He makes the odd guitar. I do it? make the odd yeah. guitar. He paints. I do paint occasionally. He paints occasionally. Not the house. He's a very talented bloke. He <laughs> tiles. He can lay floors. You know, he's brilliant. I can't. <laughs> I just write. I do. I'm useless there. But, uh, uh, yeah. But, so, we complement each other because we're totally different. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm what you see and... Nigel is a bit more refined, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. No, you, you know, we, we just bounce off each other, we do, and uh, when we give the talks, and even with our writing, you know, I mean, we've, we've never had a crossword about what we've written, and we've written thousands and hundreds of thousands of words, uh, and we just enjoy doing it. And um, There's over a million words, though. Is there a million? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I haven't counted them, but... <laughs> so I don't know, I take it with... You haven't read them, let alone count them. I, I probably wrote 900,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, so going, going back to the books, Terry Maguire, people say who's Terry Maguire, right? Now, um, there were 185 swear words in, in Unethical Conduct. That's the first book, right? Yeah, that's the first book. It, uh, and what do you think of it? The cover. What do you think of the cover? Yes, yeah, shocking. Shocking. Out, out of 10. One, thank you. That's the first book. Thank you. Second book. 
Well, you can't Shame, even tell what it is. Can crap, you? it's rubbish, it's rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. That's the airport on there. You, you, never, you never think of it. It's, it's just what, sorry? It's not rubbish, it's not rubbish. It's just not a very interesting no. cover. No, no it's, it's not really it's rubbish. Touching, is it? <laughs> <laughs> And those are the two new covers. That's, that's that's the one there, and that's to, they told you, and that's that's the professionalism of the publisher. A publisher. You know what I mean? Uh, we did it for we did it for like fun. He's doing it as a business. So the more books we sell, the more money he makes. So and he does everything. Um, this book, this um, this book of poetry, that gentleman there, he's from Nantum Oil. He's 21 years of age. He won the military cross today. And a month later, he was killed at Pilkham Ridge. Pilkham Ridge in the First World War, a battle. Um, and the picture uh, has been reversed. His picture is in the museum. Uh, so in his picture, he's looking out. But the publisher has had him looking in at the, at the poppy. And it, it's a stunning picture. It's very poignant. And I think it sums up the World War I. Um, the coal mining one, again, that's the keeper of the collieries in my stake. I don't know if anybody's seen him. Anybody been up there? It's well worth a visit in the summer, all of you. It's a little bit of a walk up to it, but it's behind the comprehensive school. It's a nine-foot statue of a coal miner carved by Chris Wood from uh, Newport. Um, that's him there, and that's the, uh, the head gear at, uh, that there is. And that's, again, the publisher. I take the pictures. And then the publisher sort of sort of does that. Um, that's the 50 famous people. That's just a spotlight, you know. Uh, I was going to put all the people on there, but he, he, did, he didn't agree with that, so I just had to agree with that. But that's the professionalism that uh, a publisher brings to, to a book, because obviously he wants to sell them. Yeah, and, and the, the key thing, difference between self-publishing, I mean, you can self-publish easy. Um, and the great thing about us coming here today is, is that it just goes to show you that, that if we can do this, anyone can do it, and at any age. Yeah. And that's really important, you know, because I didn't go back to full-time education until I was 35. Um, I managed to do a master's degree then after. But had I not gone to an adult course, which was free at that time, and spent a few weeks in that, I would never have gone on to do anything afterwards. So any sort of uh, free education courses for any age, uh, just vital. Can I just add that there were some excellent courses being run in further education, as you say. Up until the time that the, the Tories started making their cuts, yeah. there were some fabulous courses, and they were very inspiring, and the tuition was excellent. And I wrote my own book, the first one, I have had it published, yeah. and I completed it as a novella. And I had loads of encouragement from the staff at the, at the Further Education College, which is held in Pothcourt Comprehensive School, in the evening and the day. And I think it's just terrible that the government have cut, made these huge cuts, and they've cut all the talent. There was an awful lot of talent in Pothcourt, in arts, and in, in writing, and everything. And since the Tories came in, they put them, they, they cut all these services, and, you know, it's disgusting. They, they really, they didn't mention that in the budget today, that they ought to reinstate adult education in yeah. Court. And it wasn't mentioned in the budget, but I still think they should do it because it's vital for the community. You won't get any uh, disagreement from me on that one. No, I, I, just, I think no. it's extremely, extremely important to, to have adult education because it, just, just because you're getting older doesn't mean you don't want to continue learning. And, and it doesn't mean that your work in life or your, or your career is over. I mean, for writing, uh, you can do it at any age. Uh, Clive Kessler died recently, I think last week. Uh, I think he was 88, he was still writing. So the, 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 there is no age barrier when it comes to writing anyway. So it's one of the, the best things to keep your mind active as well. Isn't it, Arthur? It is, yeah, it's keeping me going. <laughs> I'm like an apprentice, I am. You know, I've been writing <laughs> four years, you know, I'm, I'm still learning. Because I didn't know what the first and the third person was. I honestly didn't when I wrote that book. I didn't know about the first person and the third <laughs> person. Because I, I wrote criminal files of evidence where I'd have like 100 statements, eight pages each, so that's 800 pages. Mm. Then I'd put a covering report on it. When I did a covering report for, say, um, an attempted murder, and I ended up in the Crown Court, 
The barrister prosecuting could prosecute off my Kevin reports. But they were so detailed, that I go through all the witnesses. And Stephen Hopkins, the judge, um, he's retired now, Stephen. Uh, when I started as a, as a DC, Stephen started as a barrister. And uh, R.L. Edwards used to give him work to get him into the court and, you know, in the magistrate court. And I'd have blokes coming back. Uh, that, that Fred had a barrister. I said, Stephen Hopkins, I said, I said, what did he do? Oh, he gave me Tory time. Um, he's, he ended up a judge. So he'd prosecute for me and he'd defend. So this week I could be pro he could be prosecuting a rapist and he'd be my prosecutor. And next week I'd have a book for robbery and he'd be defending him. But he knew me. And what he used to say, when he used to have a brief for any serious crime or, or any crime, the first thing he'd look at, who is the officer in the case? Who's put the file together? Because he, like we're saying, that he knew people, like we're saying that we knew people in the police force or teaching or whatever, he's the same with police officers. And he knew them all. And I have no doubt he met a few of these. Uh, and if I spoke down and told me, he'd probably mention their names to me. And I'd probably know them. So the, with, with Terry Maguire, there's 185 swear words in this one. Yeah, it was, it was a bit unfortunate, but yeah. we, we wanted to keep it realistic. Yeah. You, you, you don't get policemen talking to criminals and they don't say, yeah, oh, yeah, good day to you. Um, no. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Yes, I'll kindly come with you. Or uh, It just doesn't happen that way. So we wanted to give it a unique South Wales voice. So there is the occasional but in there, yeah. which is quite popular in Bridge End. Uh, and uh, the valleys. Yeah. Uh, so so with, with, uh, with Terry Maguire now, um, I created this character. And uh, my language was a bit blue, right? Right through my career. You know, I never, I didn't stuff a fool's gladly, put it that way. Whether you're villains or witnesses or whatever. I never swore on traffic. You never swore? Because you, ne you never met anybody. So I write this book and um, I'm in Penco Gym. I was in, I had my knee done and I was in, and um, I, I go through the doors and this woman walking towards me. And it's a lady by the name of Audrey Asher, who I worked, she was a female clerk when I joined in Bridgend in 1969. And she's a lovely lady, she was in my talk yesterday. And um, she sees me, I haven't seen her now for like for 20 odd years. And she hasn't changed a bit. And she runs towards me and she grabs her on me, she goes, it's you Arthur. I said, well of course it's me, who do you think it is? No, no, it's Terry Maguire, she said. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I read your book. She said, it's you. I said, you know what I mean? I can hear you, she said. I can hear the language. Because <laughs> I, she, I, I, she's there like in the telex room and I'm probably down with, and I'm, you know, with men and, you know, and, and she's there. Today, no, women would probably complain. You know, be I don't of, think they would. I think they'd join in. Well, you know what I mean? But that, but that is political correctness. No, you've got to be careful what you say, what you do. But, and, and she still talks about it. She's asked you, and, but it's not me, right? People say, oh, is he? it's not me. I suppose there are little bits in there. But um, when, in, in the first book, um, Terry Maguire is dealing with uh, a body on the, uh, down the, uh, the gravel pits down in um, Newton. So he's got that on the go. He's, got, he's been given this corrupt uh, uh, XDI. Now he's got that on the go. And he's in the incident room. And a young WPC comes in called Caroline Williams. Nothing to do with the. <laughs> and she comes in with a bit of paper. And she says to him, Sir, the super have just sent me up. There's a flasher over the dunes. Now this man is dealing with a murder, and so the super now, and he, he gets off a tirade, not at her, at the super. Bram's Hill, you know. Don't send him up a beat, you know. And then he, he sits down and he thinks, hang on, I shouldn't have said that to him. I'll pull myself in a bit. He said, look, I'll tell you what I do. He said, if you catch him, you can come and work for me. And off she's gone. She's now his DS, right? She's one of his DSs. But I've been in an incident room, a murder incident room in Bridgend where a female came in, the detective super was there, she only asked him something simple, and she had a tirade of abuse, and he basically threw her out of the room. Terry Mauger is not like that. 
but that's just an example of what it was before. Um, certainly within the police force. So it wasn't all good in the past. We, no, we do no. look look back in no. sort of rose tinted You can't glasses, you can't do it today because she'd complain straight away, wouldn't she? You know, she'd be straight downstairs, so, HR, yeah. boom, 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 boom. I've seen a woman chief inspector in police headquarters when I was cadet scram the detective super, scratch his face because he'd argued, and uh, called him everything. Um, I don't think it would happen today. <laughs> and then Norman is walking down the corridor with blood, and, and you go, she's at it again, he's going, she's off a rocker. You know, <laughs> she's off her head, man. What Christ alive? But no complaint about it. Just one of those things. She was who she was, and he was who he was. Today it's a little bit different. I think uh, the tea and oh. coffee has come. So, uh, do, you do you want to do questions later, oh, yeah, or sorry. have a cup of tea first? Yeah, sure. Up. Oh, I've got him in there. No, they're yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, we, we, we do, do, do you want do some that. questions later after tea? Do we now? We need a couple of minutes. Could I, could I just ask you, yes. um, just as uh, uh, Nigel said that uh, he wanted a right from early stage, yeah. did you find, uh, um, Arthur, in the early stage, that you had wanted to, or was this as a result of your progression through your career, that something has then wanted to come out and reflect? No, I don't think so. I think um, this all started in November 2015 when I wrote the poem. Uh, I, nothing before that? Nothing before that. No, all I did before, all the writing I did before that was files of evidence for the DPP and stuff like that. I, I wasn't, I, I had no, I had no seed in my head about writing anything. Um, I only wrote the poem because I saw it on the site. And then people liked it, so I thought I'd write another one. And I found the poetry uh, quite easy. You know, when, once I knew what I was writing, I don't make any notes. I just get the first line and I do the six verses. With the writing, if you'd say to me, Christmas Day, you'd be writing a book in February. You'll write a book in 10 days. I just said, ah, fair enough. Like, but it happened. And once I started writing then with Nigel, I write every day. If I'm not writing poetry, I'm writing chapters for the next book. But I got them all in my head. I don't, I don't take any notes. I, don't, I just open the word up and I write it. The great thing is he's really good with timelines because of his experience. Everything, you know, you've as a detective. You, yeah, you've got to have yeah. timelines in these books. You, you, you can't have people reading a book saying, hang on, that happened Tuesday and he's back on Monday. Like, you, you've got to have a timeline. And when you're investigating crime, you've got to have timelines. You've got to know where you are at specific times. You can't have a character in two places at the same time. So I do all the timelines for that. Because he's hopeless at it. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm he's on the traffic, are not Absolutely. Yeah, well, traffic. Yeah. That's right. We never had to have timelines on traffic. Anything else? Ask it. You can ask what you like. Yeah, Doesn't matter what and all. Humorous way, you might say, well, who wrote it and, and what did reflect what was reflecting on the the two policemen in Last of the Summer Wine? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, no, where, where they were not actually doing a, a huge amount of work in that way. Yeah. Yeah. What's the other one? The did comedy the, in the in the pub with the two bobbies come at the back all the time. There's there's one on it, and they the same two really two. Two uniform bobby, and they come for the drink, like a stop top and all that nonsense. Everything's all else going around outside if they're having a pint in the public. Like. And finally, have your props remained simple, or, or do you find that they have become more? No, they, they're simple. I, I just get something in my head and I write about it. As simple as that. I mean, uh, something will pop into my head, or I see something and I'll write a plot about that. Yeah, uh, and d you, you don't necessarily want to overcomplicate things yeah. either, especially if you've got two or three the, props. The, running the people who've read them. Um, uh, Phil Rickman, we were on a Phil Rickman show, and we have, uh, he read Unethical Conduct, and he thought it was brilliant. He said it's fast, it's pacey, it's gritty, um, and it's a good read. You know what I mean? they page turners there. You know, once you, once you start reading them, you want to know what's happening in the next chapter, because they were so quick. And that's the way police work, you know, is like. So I, I, when I'm writing, I, I sort of, um, it's continuous. It, 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 it all runs into each other. And then Nigel does the same with you know when he adds stuff to to the plots. Like. Mm. So that's how it basically works out. Anything else? You can ask what you like. It doesn't matter. If you had, if you had oh. any advice for someone who was wanting, who felt that they wanted to write to pick up John's point? Yeah. Just, just, just do it. Just, just do, do it. it. Yeah. You know what I mean? As long as you know what you're writing about, you know, like I couldn't write about uh, nursing, could I? You know, I couldn't write about teaching. But I'm sure the lady there who was a teacher who I know. I suppose she could write about her life as a teacher. 
when she started, like a sort of a book. So I think if you've done it, you can write about it. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the thing sometimes, uh, somebody else asked me, uh, last week I was up, bit, up in Tamworth Literary Festival doing a talk up there, and somebody asked a similar question, and uh, I said, well, you know, I've got all these things that happened to me and things. Well, you, you know, there are loads and loads of anecdotes that can turn into uh, events in stories. It's just then finding a, a, your own sort of personal voice being able to string them together in a way that makes them entertaining. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the key. My writing's there. improved, because when I started writing, I'm, I'm, I'm like a rough painter, isn't I? You know, or a, a rough bricky. But I know what I'm doing. I don't even know what I'm writing. I know what I'm writing, but I don't know how to put it together. The last four years, I was complimented by Nigel, because your writing is improving, rather. <laughs> I said, thank you very much, Nigel. It, it wasn't a dig. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> but, but I think the more you, the poetry's no problem. The poetry's poetry. I mean, now my poetry there. Anybody like poetry? What I find today with poetry is that it's too deep for people, especially people like us. I wrote Glacian, the disaster down in West Wales, the Glacian disaster where the three men got drowned. Near where I live, actually. I put that on a site, and within 10 minutes, my phone beeped. And it's a bloke called Nigel Evans. I don't know him from Adam. He's on one of the sites. And um, he basically says, thank you for that poem. That's how it was. So I said to Carl, and I said, it's some news. Sort of. So I go on the site, and I pull him up. He's a butcher now in Kili right, which is with the village where it happened. So I get in touch with him, and he said, can I have the poem? I said, of course you can. She was. I said, do what I like with it. He said, I want it for my grandchildren. And frame it up and have it printed. I said, do it like with this. He was. I've given it to you. He said, have you listened to the Poet Laureate's poem about Glacian? I said, no. But I don't read poetry and I don't listen to it. He said, well, have a listen to it. But I can't understand it. He said, you a poem. As soon as I read the first verse, that's how it was. And I think that's what people want in poetry. They want to read something and associate with it, and, and, and want to read the next verse, and read the next verse. And when it's finished, they can shut their eyes and I did Pit Ponies. It's a lovely poem. The women love it. Because I'm sure after they've read it, they shut their eyes, and they envisage this Pit Pony down in the mine, then coming up for two weeks, then going back down, then he retires, and he's in the field, spring-heeled in the field for the rest of his life. And they love it. The war horse is the same. The, you know, you read them, and you enjoy reading it. People say, because you can relate to it. And I think that's what poetry should be. And even in schools, if you want to encourage young people to read poetry, make it simple for them. You Shakespeare's and stuff, I think they, they are long gone. We progressed from there. That's, you know, I, I read Shakespeare in school. I didn't do nothing for me. However, I think in schools now, poetry should be brought in but make it under, like World War I poetry, coal mining poetry, things that are, you know, we can grasp. And you can, you, you can actually, uh, you, you know, we were talking earlier on about Welsh history. Uh, Welsh history isn't really taught in school, no. and, and it is a way of getting, getting things across to, to people. Anything else? Yes, your, your crime thrillers, they're not on the same line as Agatha Christie, for instance. No. No, no, they're a bit more raw than Agatha. <laughs> Could you tell me who, who the famous, um, very famous crime thrillers that you would compare yourself with? Ian Rankin? I, yeah. I would, no, I, I wouldn't even dare to do that. And, and the reason being is that uh, we've, we've tried to create a unique sort of local Welsh voice. Um, and... I'd, I'd love to say, stand here and say, oh, yeah, if you, if you like Ian Rankin, you, could, <laughs> you know, it's just not true. Um, if we, we're not, we've tried to do something that's different and unique to the area. Um, whether anybody likes it or not is inter, entirely if you, uh, subjective. If you, but, if you uh, do happen to read them, just let us know who it's yeah, like. Now, uh, I couldn't comment on that because I don't read crime books. <laughs> So when you talk, say so you said, this Clive Cassablo. I didn't know he was till he died. Nigel reads him, my wife reads him. I've never read him, I don't know who he is. So I don't read crime books. Why should I, why do I want to read other people's crime books when I can write my own? 
Well, <laughs> on, on that line, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you.